listening to The Cooler Ring, a podcast made for manufacturing marketers. Here are Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Welcome to The Cooler Ring, a podcast for manufacturing marketers brought to you by Cooler Partners. My name is Jeff White and joining me today is Carmen Perry. Carmen, how are you doing, mate? Happy to be here. Glad and you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. A special return guest today. Yeah, yes, it is. And, and uh, you know, just very different, interesting topics. Yeah, you know, always and uh, and very unique experiences mm. over uh, most marketers. Multi-time yeah. author, yes. including a recent children's book, which is just absolutely gorgeous. Let's, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I think it's really uh, 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 today's topic. It's 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 a it's just a interesting. It's a cool thing to try, for us to try to wrap our heads around. It's, it impacts everyone in manufacturing. It frankly impacts every citizen. Um, and uh, it, it, a lot of people talk about it, but I don't know. It still this doesn't get enough of the right kind of attention. I think people talk about, you know, concerns about uh, skill shortage and who's going to actually fill the jobs in manufacturing of tomorrow. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I, outside of the HR function, I think most people it's. You know, there's a lot of finger crossing. Yeah, and you that's talk about, about it, it but yeah, yeah it's, it's not really like something you're focused on. Right? Yeah, and, and, and not often engaging marketing minds. Yeah, in and, how to think about and, that. And, and today's guest is kind of, I guess, is looking at what is marketing's role here. What, what what role does marketing have to play in trying to make this all better? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, excited to have Mike Nager with us again. Mike is the business development manager with Festo Didactic. Welcome back to the Cooler Ring, Mike. Yeah, thank you, guys. It's really great to be back. I feel very honored. We're pleased you're here. Yeah, it's awesome to have you back on the show, Mike. And uh, without all of the technical hiccups that uh, (laughs) happened in our previous episode, uh, I say that now, and this is going to go completely sideways. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> no, we're, we're not going to go into that. Um, Mike, tell us a bit about yourself and what you've been up to since we last chatted. Love to hear a bit more about your new book as well and, and kind of what it aims to do. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I, I, as you mentioned, I work for Festo Didactic. Festo Didactic is the world's largest supplier of equipment and curriculum used for training the next generation of technicians and engineers and maintenance mechanics. Uh, we're, we're operate all over the world. It started in Germany, is now in in many many countries, and um, you know what we're doing is we're trying to fight the skills gap. Skills gap is defined as employers that are needing people to come in their doors with a certain set of skills, technical skills usually, PLC programming, robot programming, industrial maintenance, troubleshooting. Um, Those are kind of the traditional ones. Now with smart manufacturing coming up, we're, we're looking for, you know, people that have maybe artificial intelligence skills, the ability to understand how machine learning can affect the process. So the company I work for, Festo Didactic, puts all this uh, uh, domain knowledge into a training package so that students can learn about this before the first day on the job. So what we're trying to do is reduce that on-the-job training aspect by a little bit so that the students have a hands-on idea of how to do all this thing. And, and hands-on is really important because theoretical knowledge isn't good enough anymore. You have to be able to know how the equipment operates, how to load the program, for example. And uh, that's what we aim to do. In my particular function, I, I create what are called learning factories. So imagine a assembly factory that's assembling a cell phone, for example, scaled down so that it would fit inside a typical classroom at a university. And then students get to see how a cell phone is made from the time a customer orders it all the way through the production process to delivery. And that's kind of our holistic, holistic approach. This, this may sound like a kind of a strange question. I don't know, but you know, as you, as you go, go down that path and we're, you know, providing, um, uh, these, uh, you know, training uh, uh, modules, et cetera, in the universities, the other post-secondary education. Um, uh, and 
um, undoubtedly you get you know there's uptake there's a demand for this um uh, but we're also talking about this um the skills gap and the labor shortage so I, i'm just um uh, do you feel like in some ways the world of manufacturing in that educational context just has a lot of competition from other sexier sectors or sexier industries? Or is it that there's just not enough people to, to train regardless? Yeah. <laughs> Is it just a lack of people and that's it? Or uh, help me understand uh, what you're seeing on the more of the front lines of this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good observation. So, uh, you know, the Western countries, US, Canada, Europe, you know, we're facing kind of a demographic shift, right? The baby boomers are, are you know, moving out. The, the population overall is getting older, not getting younger. Um, so that's leading to, to less workers uh, as, a, as a possible pool of potential candidates. So if you look at, if, you know, what we're going to discuss a little bit later is, is looking at the skills gap and the employment kind of the same way that you look at a sales funnel. You know, you start at the top of the sales funnel with a total available market for, for customers, and then you kind of whittle it down to, you know, what is your product serving and what's the product available market, and you do all these kind of fancy calculations. Well, you can do a very similar thing with labor and and attracting new employees there's a pool of people you know maybe between 20 years old and 50 years old that are potentially uh, could be employees of your company and then as you get down through this funnel it gets smaller and, and, and smaller so uh, part of the issue is is the skills of the people that are inside that funnel is kind of limiting the size of it and then uh, to your point, manufacturing is looking for the exact same employees that finance is looking for, that medicine and medical is looking for, what the um, information companies and social media companies are looking for. Everyone wants, you know, smart, knowledgeable, good soft skill type employees that are 20, 25, 30 years old. And uh, yeah, manufacturer A is not competing against manufacturer B for those people. Well, they are, but they're also competing against uh, Trader Joe's uh, that's advertising uh, $20 an hour uh, to come work for them or uh, for more of the sexier industries as, as you uh, described it. So, so that, that's, part, that's a big part of the plan uh, or a big part of the problem, uh, I, I should say. Is do you feel that manufacturers are starting to understand that, or do you think that they, you know, there's still an awful lot of them out there that just think they're competing against other manufacturers for the talent? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that is correct. I, I don't think they realize how how broad the the competition is uh, for talent, um, and, and that's kind of what my my night job is. Actually, it's not a night job; it's a hobby. So you mentioned that I'm a an author of, of books. Uh, those books don't uh, generate revenue or, or a profit, so I call it a hobby. Uh, but what I did is, uh, especially during COVID, because my, my travel was highly restricted, I had a lot of spare time that I'd normally be traveling, I, I set about to writing books for people that are not in the manufacturing industries but should be aware of it. So the first one I wrote was geared towards high school students and high school counselors to talk about smart manufacturing and it's a neat place to go to work and you might want to consider it. But that book was already kind of preaching to the choir by the time a kid is 15, 16, that his or her path is already set pretty much. So that book was only going and approaching people that had already self-selected themselves in some way to be in a technological field Maybe not considering manufacturing, but with this book, maybe if they read it, they'd be like, oh, that, that would be kind of neat to make things. So the last, uh, the last one that I wrote is, is a, a, pitcher, a pitcher book, a rhyming pitcher book aimed at eight-year-olds. So that the idea was that uh, parents could read this with their kids at, you know, before bedtime, 
and there would be nice color photos of cool looking little robots moving around the factory hanging from the ceiling and I kind of name them you know funny names you know that kids w w would enjoy and the idea there is let's expand that sales funnel um, that we talked about so that more people are going to consider it at the very top and I figured about eight years old was where it had to be approached. I don't think most manufacturers, when they're looking or considering talent and have their meetings with HR about how to get it, are thinking at all about an eight-year-old. It's a 12-year-plus uh, <laughs> sales cycle, man. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a while, yeah. <laughs> that's, only, that's only slightly longer than the normal B2B <laughs> manufacturing sales cycle, as it turns out. <laughs> yes, I, you might be on to something. Uh, illuminating the dark parts of the pediatric funnel. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really horrible when you say it like that. But I mean, I, I get it. it. One of my first um, gigs out of uh, university was working for a large forestry company and who also owned a number of manufacturing companies. And their entire goal by hiring... Uh, a designer like myself and, and a couple of other designers and developers was to create interactive content to hit kids in elementary school to tell them that there were great jobs in forestry. You know, so that and that was in the in the late 90s. It's fairly prescient for a, a, a pretty conservative company mm. to approach it that way. Um, you know, it's interesting what you say about, you know, kind of you're competing against Trader Joe's and you're competing against others who are, you know, we're, we're well, starting to get finance, to, medical, pharmaceutical. Yeah. I think that's, I guess it's the across the whole board and, and they're all kind of offering living wage levels of, uh, of employment. Um, you know, how, how do you think, how do you compete with that? Because I, I still think manufacturing suffers from a bit of an image problem amongst that group in terms of understanding the, the level of interesting things that are going on, the, you know, how many opportunities there are, you know, and plus if, you know, if it's a field you're interested in, you could go for a very long time and, and kind of grow your career within those manufacturers. So how, you know, a children's book is a great first step to kind of make people aware, but how do we how do we communicate that, you know, these are sexy jobs, they are interesting, and they're going to pay better than living wage type salaries? Yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think there still is a very negative image of manufacturing, uh, not completely unfounded, by the way, you know, since the 1990s, you know, we've lived in a world of globalization, where manufacturing was was offshore to, to other parts of the world. And, and people saw shrinking job opportunities. Um, they really weren't shrinking, they were shifting, right? Uh, with, with all the current talk in the last two, three years, looks like that globalization model is changing pretty radically. So we can expect to see manufacturing coming back to, to places either you know, in the US or Canada or you know, nearby in Mexico or, or Latin America. Um, but it, it still suffers from that, that negative image, dark, dirty, dangerous, uh, dingy. Uh, but, you know, if you walk into a, a world-class manufacturing plant, what are you going to see? Well, well, you guys know you're going to see sparkling equipment, clean floors, uh, professionals on the floor working on very um, expensive and, and sophisticated equipment. So, so what can an individual manufacturer do? You know, so, so I've always worked in customer facing positions, usually for industrial control companies before I started at, at, at Festo uh, Didactic. So we spend a lot of time in marketing looking for new customers. I would say, you know, marketing and sales probably work very closely or hopefully work very closely together in most companies. And, um, Thousands and hundreds of thousands or, or, or many millions of dollars are spent uh, approaching and trying to identify and capture customers. And my thought is, you know, that marketing message that's used to attract customers, that, that power and that, that concept could be used to try to attract employees and talent into an organization. So I don't see that happen 
very often, or it's not immediately noticeable. If you go, you know, to online job advertisements and look at it, you know, if you're reading the text, it wouldn't be that different from, you know, reading text in 1985 in the paper where someone was asking for a PLC programmer and, and listing all these things in kind of a boring manner, uh, very focused on the company's needs and not really approaching it from like, well, what, what's in it for that person that might apply. So, so my, my idea, and, and I floated it on LinkedIn and a couple articles that got a little bit of, of back and forth going is, why not have marketing approach you know, this talent issue with the same intensity as you look for customers? Uh, because as you mentioned in the beginning, everyone says this is a top three concern, talent. So why not put the money where the mouth is in that case? Well, it's interesting, uh, you know, because as Jeff was saying, you know, you mentioned living wage. I think we're way, you know, we're way beyond what just talking about as the wages or the wages keeping pace. keeping pace. Yeah. Like we have salary samesies now. I yeah. think we can say across a broad range of categories. We have, you know, you mentioned career opportunities, like the notion somebody could could advance within a particular manufacturer. Um, you know, you guys have children, I don't, but. I'm going to suggest to you that the kids don't care about that because they've got plenty of career opportunities regardless. Like, I, I think they can bounce. Like, I, I, you know, we're, we're here, people talking about a recession, and there's under 4% unemployment. You know, we have a full employment recession, basically, <laughs> being uh, talked about. Um, so, it, you know, it comes down, you know, I, I hate to say So, I, I will... Uh, I will both roll my eyes and uh, ask the question at the same time. <laughs> I guess, well, uh, because I, I kind of roll my eyes a bit at the Simon Sinek, um, it starts with why kind of like everything is about saving the planet or something. And sometimes when you talk about that, you get through that lens and I can just, get, I, I'm, I'm a jaded old man sometimes. And I think that comes across. Um, but, you know, manufacturing is competing in that world. Uh, and when you talk about competing with, a, you know, a software startup or the finance or the uh, medical technology or pharmaceuticals, um, some of those categories are a bit better at communicating their why and uh, connecting with the uh, prospective young talent at that level, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I think we see we see those examples, you know, almost, you know, on, on a daily basis of, of industries and organizations that that kind of get it, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of hubbub about you know people wanting you know to have uh, their work meaningful, not not just a, a good living wage paycheck. And uh, you know, I think there's some merit to that. I think there's some some truth to it. You know, I also think it's a little bit you know exaggerated, but um, I, it's it's still an important aspect of it. But that's certainly something that that could and should be exploited. Um, you know, a lot of manufacturing is kind of like a black box. You really don't know what's going inside the organization. Even literally, you know, you, um, you pass a, a big building on the side of the highway. It has no windows, uh, steel walls or, or, or concrete walls. And you literally don't know what's going on inside that building, that there's robots running around, there's cool technologies, there's high wages. Uh, part of the idea is let's not make it a black box anymore. Let's expose this stuff to the general public. So, you know, things like mission statements, you know, they could be an important part of it. You're working to produce products and services that are environmentally friendly or have that social um, uh, advantage or social, um, I can't think of a word, but... Um, uh, help society, you know, uh, improve in some way, make that visible. From from a, a, a job standpoint, you know, what you're competing against is the supermarket that has a, a huge flag outside saying, you know, come work f for us for $16 an hour, and in three months you'll be promoted to assistant manager and you'll make nineteen fifty an hour, you know. Uh, that's the visibility, you know, into a little bit of that, 
that job and okay, what's my career progression uh, going to be? Um, most manufacturers, I would hazard to guess, it's it's completely unknown until you make it through four levels of of interviews and and then you find out what the compensation might be. And I don't think that's a viable solution anymore. You can't hold the cards that close to the to your chest because uh, everyone's out there looking for the the same few people that want to be hired. So. I love when you bring up uh, like Trader Joe's or the supermarket down the street or whatever as the competition because it's just <laughs> that, uh, man, um, it, 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 it just drives the point home. I'm curious, Mike, if you've, you know, you've spent a lot of time thinking about this and looking at the marketplace um, and globally, in fact, do you see any manufacturers in any particular market um that you've kind of identified say you know what they seem to really get it like of all the people i've seen man they, they these people seem like they're changing their approach yeah so the 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 best example i can think of and unfortunately it's a little bit dated uh was that general electric had had done a whole series of campaigns and advertisements a few years ago before they they had their their big troubles that they have now and uh, and it was aimed directly at talent. So it was um, a TV commercial. It was probably on one of the Super Bowls. And it, w- it was the idea of there's a, a bunch of young people who just graduated from college with software engineering or software uh, degrees sitting around talking about what their new first job was, right? So it's all job job number one right after university. And uh, the one the one guy says, you know, that, He's making, he works for General Electric and he's, he's making turbines that save, you know, 3% of the energy cost and it's going to save the polar bears. Um, and, and everyone's like, oh, that's interesting, but they're kind of muted. And, and the other guy is like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm working for Silicon Valley and we're making an app where you can put uh, hats on top of your cat in uh, photos. And everyone's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so it's probably available on, on on the internet, but they were they were actually you know uh, doing a couple things. You know, first of all, they were looking for talent. Second of all, they were showing you know, hey, we're doing something substantial in the world. You can come and and be part of it. And then they were also giving like a little wink to the flashier type of uh, industries, especially Silicon Valley, right? Because Silicon Valley came out and they just blew all the pay scales out of out of the water if you could get into one of those companies. I mean, you, you really made it, right? So, right, right. Um, so, so that's the best example that, that, that I can uh, think of right now. It's interesting that that's still that little uh, kind of a wink to the, to the putting the hats on the cats, right? Um, <laughs> it's kind of shows a little bit of insecurity at the same time, doesn't it? I, I, I mean, it, it's like they feel like they have to kind of poke fun. Right. And I kind of feel like in some ways that's, you know, ma- manufacturing. I mean, we even see it in the, when I, frankly, when I think about agencies that focus on manufacturing, because that's our world. And so many of them call themselves industrial marketing agencies. And then they, um, uh, and they, 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 you know, they don't necessarily want to emphasize often the more high tech for nature of today's manufacturing. Um, and I think if we kind of leaned into that versus try to justify it, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of coolness there, right? Yeah. Um, and solving real problems. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just interesting to me that a company at the scale of GE at that time would uh, you know, still feel compelled to, to kind help. of, but maybe they just needed to kind of bring some humor yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, I'm not I, trying I to of... poke fun at the ad without actually uh, going back yeah. and watching it. But um, Mike, I do think. Um, you know, of course, what Festo is doing in terms of these factories in a box and and that sort of thing, are you finding that that also is helping to drive more interest in the sector? Like, do schools that implement that kind of platform so that students can actually learn on on the real tools, um, do they see an uptick in in interest from students who are looking to go into manufacturing potentially? Yeah, yeah, that, that that's a good point because our universities and educational systems they're 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 also a business, right? And their customers are students, and they've got to get students into seats. And if a program 
is unable to do that for whatever reason, then you know the, the college or the university can't keep it active, and and you know it it has been a struggle in some, I would say most places, to have a full class of industrial engineers or mechanical engineers, because there's a lot of other majors that are out there. So part of what we do at Festo that directly helps our customers, let's just say it's a university, is the systems that we provide uh, are a you know technologically at the forefront of manufacturing. So we have artificial intelligence and machine learning and augmented reality and virtual reality all incorporated into this factory, this learning factory that we sell. So so that's that's number one. Number two we spend a lot of effort to make it as aesthetically pleasing um, to look at as possible. So when you see it, it's all stations, it's uh, steel and, and smoked glass control cabinets. Um, and you know those students that come in maybe for a, a tour of the university, when they see that, I'm going to be working on a, a piece of equipment like this, uh, that helps get those seats filled and and in many of our customers you know that they will open up their their labs in the summertime to much younger students high school and middle school students so West Virginia University just did this uh, the past summer they held a series of summer camps and now they're trying to attract okay who's that nine-year-old ten-year-old thirteen-year-old that maybe in two or three years might want to enroll at the program at uh, WVU, so you know they're very much looking at that as a as an outreach program as well. So it's it's interesting, you know. That's a that's a great uh, it's a, you know it's great to think of that contribution though and how you know because we were just saying you know these black boxes on the factory you dri or, or on the highway you drive by you don't know what's going on mm -hmm. inside them. Of course, that's a what a great way to expose people to that and to let people know that that's an option. And, and of course, the, the universities that are doing the summer programming for the younger kids are, are to certainly be commended for that. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that's, that's really interesting about it, and I say this as a dad of three high school aged and university aged kids who are changing their minds frequently and trying to figure out what it is that they want to do. I mean, we were talking a little bit ago about this idea of, you know, creating a funnel for um, sales of jobs, I guess, if you really want to be crass about it and, and diminish it. But, uh, you know, what do you think? Because, you know, kids see this stuff when they're younger and, and they're, they get an impression of it and, and it maybe it sticks with them or maybe it doesn't. But, you know, what do you think the industry can do kind of in that sort of phase between first awareness that hey there's you know there are these interesting jobs and they are high tech and they're pretty interesting and, and they're going to pay well as a you know a middle school kid to keep them engaged you know along that path along that funnel until they're you know ready to choose a school and then ready to apply to a manufacturer like what what should manufacturers be thinking about um in terms of keeping awareness going um, through those uh, rather difficult teenage years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a good point, you know. And and most manufacturers are not are not you know super large, right? It's a small, medium sized businesses with limited resources, and and I appreciate that, you know. Not not every company is a Siemens or a GE or something of that scale. So, but you know, there there are some simple things uh, that can be done. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, you can take an active role with the educational community in your area, and that's not going to require too much time of someone on your staff to, to engage with the high school, with the community college, or the universities that are in your area to, to let them know that you exist and, you know, you're in the market to hire people. And also um, to, to provide assistance on what are they teaching? You know, what, what skill sets are you looking for, both hard skills and soft skill wise, that would be very helpful. And that's a direct avenue. So, you know, you don't have to just kind of sit back and complain that the people knocking on your door don't have these skills. 
but you can take an active role in helping shape those skills just by being active uh, with the community. The other thing that you can do in the US, I'm not sure if it's in Canada, but in October is designated Manufacturing Week. And there's actually a Manufacturing Day where the members are asked, the manufacturing members are asked to open their doors to the public to allow students and parents and teachers and anyone else that's interested to, to come into their facility and to actually see what it is that they're doing inside there. Uh, you know, that would not take much time and, and money. We're talking about a single day. Uh, maybe you could, you know, put together a nice little package of information or, you know, maybe some of those uh, uh, nice little marketing tools that are usually handed out at trade shows, baseball caps and, and things of that nature. And uh, just let people know that this is what we're doing in here. Yeah, we got some robots. They're pretty cool. We have some AGVs. Oh, wow. Someone has to program those. Um, you know, you can't underestimate, you know, that there's going to be a certain percentage of, you know, 10-year-olds that see that, and they're going to remember that for the next eight years and show up and, and knock on your door. So so those are a couple ideas I would suggest. And, and Meg, I think it's important that you note that, that you know, most manufacturers aren't, uh, you know, uh, Siemens or, or G, and uh, you know they're 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 typically smaller, and they they really are. They may be smaller on a global scale, but they're very big in their local communities very often, and, and they they can have outsized impact in those communities should they should they choose to, and uh, should should they choose to take your advice in that regard. And and I think you know for the marketers listening, um, it seems to me that there's a a straighter connection or direct connection between what Mike's talking about and the, the kind of uh, uh, the way that many mid-sized manufacturers articulate their value. Uh, I mean, it's so much, how many times have we joked about, uh, you know, the cliche, it's our, it's our top quality people, the best service and the best quality products. And <laughs> we, we always laugh about it. But, well, if we're talking about competing through the best quality people, the bet we have the best people. So okay, well, you don't have to go too far from that to actually having a marketing campaign that's basically all about recruitment, but is a veiled way of creating awareness for the manufacturing organization writ large. Like, you know what I mean? You, you could you could kill two birds with one stone here. Yep. Uh, and and it's uh, these these dots are closer to be to being connected than than a lot of uh, dots that marketers try to connect. Yeah, it's like hey, marketers. You want to get a little more budget for something else, right? Right, and it not, you know, and sometimes I think when we talk about using marketing on the in the HR function, it's like okay, well then we're not we're going to take a break from from our work on attracting customers no. to go over here and try to attract talent. But I actually think you could attract uh, you, you could design a campaign to attract talent that's really designed to attract customers. Is what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Not to I not not to ideate in a room, but I, I just when you mentioned about those mid-sized manufacturers, like well, you know, that's a real interesting opportunity that's open to them that I bet they're not thinking about. Yeah, it's probably probably better than sponsoring a baseball team or a hockey team too. You know, be well, more active in it. Be probably do both, but yeah. uh, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, it's I do not to... want to be on the record as being against baseball. <laughs> <laughs> it's America's game. Downright on America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, what's uh, what's next for you? Um, you know, you've been uh, you've been engaged in 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 authoring some books and and still kind of reaching out and working with uh, with schools to implement these um, these skills, you know, programs and, and all of that. But where where are you headed next? Yeah. So um, what I'm developing now is a series of workshops. So you know. Um, Aside from the books, taking the content that are that are in the books that introduce smart manufacturing uh, to people that don't have a direct experience with it. So uh, a series of in-person and and online uh, workshops. That's kind of what's on my my agenda to to develop uh, right now. So I, I've had a few did a few trial ones last year, and they worked out worked out pretty well. So, sometimes the people that are in attendance for the workshop might be high school teachers uh, that are teaching STEM, uh, know a lot about science and math, 
but maybe not so much about manufacturing. So, you know, in a couple hours, we kind of bring them right up to speed on what's happening in, in the manufacturing industries. Sometimes it's elected officials that are trying to figure out where they're going to put their funding uh, for education and training because there's a huge push for it, but it's very unclear in their mind. Manufacturing is just one of those many industries that we had talked about uh, a little bit earlier where, where government funding could be put towards that education. So, you know, we the workshop's designed to say, okay, you know, this is manufacturing. We think it's coming back big time, and we think we have a lot of skills that we have to have our, our people acquire to make it a success. So let's put our money there. So so that's what I'm working on right now is, is, is these workshops anywhere from four hours to, you know, maybe two days long, something of that nature. You know, Mike, your, your commitment to uh, attacking this challenge from almost seemingly every possible angle is it, it, it's it's inspirational i think i hope the, the people listening uh you know check mike out go find him online we'll link up uh his books as well um yep. uh I, you know frankly i think the world of manufacturing could use uh several thousand uh mics here <laughs> so uh you know if, Not that uh, we're trying to create competition for you, but I think you'd agree it's probably a good thing. Uh, no, I, I, and I think there's an awful lot to learn from just uh, going and seeing what, what, what he's been up to and, and what he's doing next, and, uh, and and the world of manufacturing will be better for it. Yeah, yeah, I'd appreciate anyone that's interested in it to reach out to me. I'm an open networker on LinkedIn and, and always happy to talk about the subject, so please do so. It's wonderful to have you on the show once again, good sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks for listening to The Cooler Ring with Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Don't miss a single manufacturing marketing insight. Subscribe now at coolapartners.com slash the cooler ring. That's K-U-L-A partners.com slash the cooler ring.